It's now my very great honor to introduce today's keynote speaker, Dr. Marcia McNutt. Dr. McNutt received her BA in Physics, summa cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa, from Colorado College, and her PhD in Earth Sciences from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Following three years with the United States Geological Survey working on earthquake prediction, Dr. McNutt joined the faculty at MIT. After leaving MIT, she became president and chief executive officer of the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. In 2009, she was appointed director of the United States Geological Survey and science advisor to the United States Secretary of the Interior. She is the first woman to serve as director of the USGS in the agency's 130-year history. 134 years, I learned yesterday, I think. Dr. McNutt has participated in 15 major scientific voyages, serving as chief scientist on more than half of them. Her research has ranged from studies of ocean island volcanoes in French Polynesia to continental breakup in the western United States. Among her many awards and honors, Dr. McNutt is a fellow of the Geological Society of America, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the American Geophysical Union, which awarded her the McElwain Medal in 1988 and the Mara Schoening Medal in 2007. Please join me in welcoming Dr. McNutt to our campus today. Well, thank you, President Scoggins. I am just delighted to be able to speak to you today. I'm sure that each of the thousands of commencement speakers who are addressing more than a million members of the class of 2011 to graduate in the next two months can't help but draw on his or her recent experiences. But your misfortune on this beautiful Colorado morning is that my last 18 months has been spent dealing with an earthquake in which 230,000 souls in Haiti perished on account of substandard building practices on the island of Haiti. Or a volcanic eruption that brought transatlantic airline travel to a halt and caused $6 billion in economic losses on account of the absence of aircraft engine standards for volcanic ash. I dealt with an offshore deep sea oil well blowout that took 87 days to contain because oil spill response had not kept pace with offshore exploration. And then next there was a tsunami that triggered a major nuclear crisis because a major risk scenario was overlooked. And finally, all time record breaking floods on the mighty Mississippi and its tributaries that were barely contained by an aging levee system. In fact, my so-called friends from NOAA are calling me the master of disaster. But these challenges have underscored for me how dependent the USGS, the nation, and in fact the world are on scientists and engineers to solve an ever more complex tangle of man's interaction with the environment. If we are to reduce risk, we must continue to attract scientifically and technically savvy researchers and technicians who over the course of their long careers acquire new skill sets and constantly remain relevant as problems wax and wane in importance and as new solutions present themselves. A more enlightened workforce that rather than considering conservation and development as two end members of a spectrum, sees sustainability as the human imperative for this planet. We need strategic thinkers who move nimbly between conventional upstream, downstream, and recycle concepts to instead embrace the dynamics of full life cycle. We need unconventional brain power that can deal with ambiguity, complexity, and paradox to create new fields where none existed, to bring upon new solutions that aren't even yet the stuff of science fiction. You, the Colorado School of Mines class of 2011, will be part of this brave new future. Now, for some of the parents in the audience, you may be very proud of daughters, sons, 
and grandchildren following in your own footsteps as brilliant scientists and engineers. Chips off the old block, so to speak. In fact, I had a fun conversation with a very proud grandmother as I was waiting in the line for the ladies' room this morning, um, who was here to celebrate two grandchildren who are the class of 2011. In fact, she said her whole family are scientists and engineers. And wow, I'm proud of her. She is personally solving the nation's STEM crisis. But let me address more directly the other category of parents and grandparents. The ones of you out there who are scratching your heads, wondering where your mathematically gifted progeny came from, as was the case of my own parents. When I graduated as a physics major, my businessman father and my homemaker mother advanced the theory of the baby mix-up at birth in the hospital. But there in front of them was the counter evidence. I was the spitting image of my mother. My father even made me take an accounting course at the University of Minnesota over the summer that I would have something useful to fall back on when I ended up broke and unemployed after graduation, which never happened. I didn't move home. I didn't need to use dad's credit card. So for all of you concerned parents out there, I'm living proof that scientists do make a living doing what they are trained to do and do what they love. I had the good fortune that my own career path allowed me to be one of the most, part of the one of most finest institutions of science and technology education in this nation. A school very much like the Colorado School of Mines, one that eats, breathes, and sleeps STEM. And STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. In fact, back when I was on the faculty at MIT, I remember being a good listener as my colleagues from other colleges would discuss the challenges of teaching geophysics without being able to use calculus. And then I would casually drop the fact that I taught intro geophysics using spherical harmonics without the MIT students even blinking an eye. These conversations with my colleagues would remind me of the fact that there was an entire STEM-phobic world out there beyond my everyday life. So why am I telling you these stories? Unless you've been in a coma for the last decade, you are probably aware that our nation is facing a crisis in the supply of STEM education professionals. Simply put, in my opinion, the future of the country rests more in our output of you, the rocket scientists, rather than in that of the art historians. I have concerned about where the US Geological Survey is going to find its workforce of the future, a workforce that needs to be far more diverse than our current staff if it's going to reflect America and solve the complex interdisciplinary challenges of tomorrow. Simply consider the recent trend nationwide that's closed down mining geology programs and reduced to a trickle the supply of graduates against the growing recognition that the U.S. should not become totally dependent on foreign sources of strategic minerals, such as rare earth elements. So what can be done to increase the STEM workforce and ideally make it diverse as America? Educational institutions have tried through targeted scholarships and innovation innovative educational programs. Government agencies have tried through internships and mentorship programs. Even private foundations in industry have attempted to solve the problem by investing time, talent, and resources. But the problem is still with us. One strategy we have not tried is to work together, taking advantage of the strengths that each partner can provide in engaging students at different phases in their educational careers to develop an appreciation for STEM early on and continue to nurture it in a seamless handoff. Students need to be identified in junior high or earlier and involved in hands-on activities and mentorship programs. The sooner you start learning anything, the easier it is. And yet most elementary school teachers have only taken the minimum required courses in science and mathematics and most say they are uncomfortable with much of the subject matter. How can we expect students to believe that the material is fun and easy if their teachers don't think that way. Students should be offered summer enrichment experiences that are meaningful and enjoyable. They need good guidance in high school on course selection and possible supplementing of high school curriculum. 
Willie Nelson sang, Mama, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. But what he forgot to say was, please, let them grow up to be scientists and engineers. If we work together, maybe we can make that happen. And finally, we need to change the image of the STEM professional from the nerd to the smart, savvy trendsetter in a techno-dependent society. From the mad scientist out to destroy the world to the hero who saves the planet. In a new book out on the BP oil spill entitled A Hole at the Bottom of the Sea, The Race to Kill the BP Gusher by Washington Post investigative reporter Joel Achenbach, he tells the story of USGS hydrologist Paul Shea out of our Menlo Park office. On July 15th of last year, as the Macondo well was being shut in by the three bore capping stack, pressure readings were unexpectedly low. The interpretation was ambiguous as to whether the well was more depleted than predicted from 87 days of flow into the ocean or whether the well was leaking into surrounding formations, a dangerous situation which could lead to uncontrollable breakouts, which would lead to eventually dumping the entire reservoir into the ocean, the dreaded oil mageddon. Secretary Chu's science advisory team recommended out of an abund abundance of caution that BP be ordered to reopen the well the next morning. Paul Shea worked through the night on a reservoir model to explain the pressure readings as the well was shut in. By dawn, he had the answer. The reservoir was simply depleted. Based on his scientific interpretation, the Macondo remained shut in. America's oil spill nightmare was over, and the well never spilled another drop of oil. Scientists can be heroes. I hope some of you find, over the course of your career, your moment to shine. Congratulations, class of 2011. The future is in your hands. May you all find your way to be heroes. Thank you.